Thank you. Thank you uh, for inviting me to be one of the speakers and I apologize for not being able to be with you in person, but hopefully I can share some of uh, my knowledge and experience over Skype like this. So I'm going to talk about hazardous waste management and disposal, which I think it's a, it's a big problem and uh, one of the problems that we are not really focusing on at, at these days, which we should. And uh, I put a saying here from the cradle to the grave. So we need to re realize that we are responsible for gener when we generate the waste. We are responsible from, for that waste from the point of generation. So when we start those cultures, process those samples, all the way until that waste is rendered completely uninfectious and it's actually disposed properly of. So that, that responsibility lies on us. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And so if you look at, uh, this is just some of the pictures of the waste um, being, you know, put into these large waste disposal places, which is fine if your waste is de decontaminated, but can you imagine if you are putting infectious waste in some of these uh, overall general disposal sites and you have people or animals uh, you know, anybody can kind of wander and get infected potentially. So I think that proper waste disposal is important not just for biosafety and biosecurity, which certainly is, but also for overall public health. Next, please. So when we talk about waste disposal, we often talk about different steps in the process, and I highlighted some of the steps here. So we talk about collection of the waste. How do we actually collect the waste? Do we have a proper uh, equipment to collect the waste? Do we know what waste to collect? Where do, we, where do we collect the waste? Is it at the patient side? Is it, you know, in a lab? Depending on where you are. Also, we talk about proper waste segregation. So not putting sharps, for example, such as needles together with your waste from gloves or waste from, you know, paper waste and things like that. So we are trying not to mix that waste if possible. Uh, we also talk about storage. Sometimes we can't dispose of the waste or we have to wait for the autoclave or for the incinerator and we can't necessarily throw the waste out. So when we store that waste, do we have a place where we can store the waste? Is it a secure place so not everybody can have access? Hopefully it's not, you know, something, a dumper that you put the waste in behind the hospital or a lab. Hopefully it's something where you can put your waste and lock it until you can dispose of it properly. Then also there's the issue of transportation of waste. In the United States, this is highly regulated. We are not allowed to transport infectious waste across state lines. So really, we have to make sure that the waste is decontaminated prior to moving it anywhere uh, within, uh, on a public highways within a state, but also crossing to the other states. So again, that, that's another one of those issues. And you can imagine if you are transporting waste and there's an accident or something happened, you might actually end up having the issue with the, that waste and having much bigger need for a response to clean it up and properly dispose at that time, not to mention potential exposure to the surrounding areas. Um, obviously, disposal is important. A lot of places uh, dispose of their waste themselves. Sometimes there are companies that will come and pick up your waste and dispose of that waste for you. But even then, you have to follow guidelines and not just give anything and, and everything to the company um, and make sure that what you, are, you know what you are giving and you get an uh, answer from the company once it's uh, decontaminated, disposed of, that it's actually done. So that's something, and I'll talk a little bit about um, how do we set up this at the national level. And then there, there are many other issues. Some of them that I wanted to also highlight is that a lot of times there's no waste disposal um, regulations within a country. And so if you don't have those regulations, then really how can you follow something that you are not sure what to do with? And this needs to be done at the country level, so at the ministry level, and hopefully the, we, they're able to provide some of the guidelines and um, 
to help you go through these steps that I mentioned. A lot of times I also see that there are no, no waste disposal programs within institutions, be it a research institution or maybe a hospital or diagnostic lab. And so maybe a country will have a guidelines for waste disposal, but on the other hand, the institution had not developed a program that manages waste disposal and kind of keeps track of what's going on. A lot of time, obviously, there is lack of resources, so we don't have what we need at our fingertips. We don't have, I hear a lot of times, we don't have a sharps container, we don't have resources to purchase some, uh, we don't have bags for proper disposal of waste. And I will talk about um, a, a successful uh, program that actually we managed to help do that. And also, as, as um, Nicholas pointed out, there's often lack of training and education or overall general awareness. The issues that I see is with people that actually manage the waste at the institution level. A lot of times those people are not educated and uh, they, they, sometimes they can't even read. So posting signs and uh, expecting them to know to what the sign says and what they should do uh, it's not realistic. So these people need hand-on training, uh, and a lot of times when you do hand-on training, they can do it and do it really, really well. I see in places where you, you know, you de like I said, you do this uh, waste segregation. We can go on to next slide, please. So if we do the proper waste segregation, I, I mentioned that's the key, really. So not mixing your sharps with your paper with your other things that you might be throwing in, in the trash. And so if you have people that uh, understand that you are not supposed to mix what's in each bin, that's great. Because I've seen places where, you know, you have half of the ye yellow bin that's full, maybe a little bit of the red bin, a little bit of the blue bin, and you get your cleaning crew, your, you know, waste disposal people, and they'll just mix everything to consolidate. They'll be, well, you know, it's half in here, a little bit in here. Why waste space? Let's just put everything together. And that's absolutely wrong because that's how you run into those issues of mixed waste, which is much, much harder to uh, deal with at that time. Next slide, please. This is just uh, some general guidelines for you. If you are storing waste, it should be stored in a secured area, ju not just laying around anywhere, especially if you are in a hospital where it's a publicly open environment, so people are coming in and out of, of the place. And so you don't want them coming in contact with your infectious waste. And again, as much for biosecurity reason, like Nicholas said, you don't want that sample of Ebola walking around. Uh, or somebody picking it up, but also for biosafety reasons, because you do not want people getting in touch with potentially infectious material and getting infected and then spreading that infection um, outside of the environment. Next, please. So here I just pointed out some uh, examples of the most common laboratory waste. So we often talk about biological waste, but we also work in the labs with chemicals, and that's in the research lab as well as diagnostic lab, so we have to worry about disposal of chemicals as well. Sometimes we work with radioactive waste as well, uh, especially in the research labs, sometimes in a hospital as well, as well if we are treating patients or doing some markers, um, tests that require markers and things like that. A lot of times there's mixed waste because people put waste together and then we have to worry about. If you think about mixed waste here in the United States, especially for chemical waste, if you have chemical waste that's mixed or unlabeled and you don't know what it is, it is going to cost you five times more to dispose of that waste than if it was just a single item or if it was properly labeled so we know what we are disposing of. Uh, we also talk about liquid versus solid versus sharps, and again, for each of those, there are slightly different ways of treatment and disposal of that waste. And um, I'll address that as we move forward. Next slide, please. Next one, please. These are just some of the regulations. Nicholas points you to a couple of the regulations out there. There are many regulations that are at the uh, 
national level and the, uh, probably within the country, but also outside at the international level. And these are just some examples of, of regulations that you can look up. Some of these are US centric and um, I don't, uh, I'm not telling you to follow them, but I think they provide a good example of how potentially to structure some of the documents that you might develop within your country in order to manage waste. Next, please. These are just some links for you to use uh, instead of searching the internet. Google is great, but sometimes it's much easier just to click on a little link. So this is also for you just to make it a little bit easier. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, treatment of waste. I give you here some definitions. I'm not going to read the definitions. This is just a refresher for all of us. Uh, and um, I'm going to move on to next slide, please. So oftentimes when we talk about biological waste, we talk about different um, treatment methods. And depending on where you are and what you are allowed to do, this might vary a bit. So we can do autoclaving, we can do incineration at times, sometimes we do deep burial, um, sometimes we are just doing destruction and shredding, uh, especially in a case of sharps. Uh, disposing in a secure landfill is also an option, although we are trying to stay away from that these days. And sometimes we also do chemical treatment. There are good and bad things about each of these methods. Obviously, uh, and, and I will mention that a little bit more in, towards the end of my talk, is you have to, every method you use, you have to validate. So you need to make sure that what you are saying that is being done is actually being done. So just because an autoclave is there and you can push a button and, you know, like Nicola said, and magically something happens and your waste is now done and decontaminated, it doesn't always mean that it's truly uh, accomplished. And so you have to periodically validate the machine itself, but also you have to validate the load. So what are you putting in that machine? Does that, is that being processed the right way and rendering your waste in infection? Also, another thing I wanted to point out, when we talk about chemical treatment, pre please do realize that although it's convenient and might be uh, somewhat quick, you are uh, getting rid of potentially bio biological waste, but you might be generating now additional chemical waste that you will have to dispose of. So it, it's something to think about before opting for any particular um, uh, of these uh, options. Next one, please. So here is just an example of some autoclaves. They do come in many sizes. Uh, they are really the ultimate goal for all of these autoclaves is providing sterility. So that is achieved by um, pro to, from two ways. So by temperature, that's uh, high steam is basically pumped into an autoclave at a high temperature, but also under certain pressure. So I gave you parameters here. It's usually 121 Celsius for the uh, temperature that we try to achieve within an autoclave. That's the minimum temperature that we try to achieve. Sometimes we can achieve higher temperature, and there are pros and cons of both. And then under a pressure, which is uh, usually 15 PSI. So Again, when we validate machine, we validate that we, the machine gets to the temperature that we need, so 121 or higher, and that actually gets to the pressure that we need inside that chamber, because that's how we actually can tell that the machine is doing what it's supposed to do. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of incineration. Again, I give you some uh, in general information regarding incineration. Things I want to point out is that these incinerators have to be maintained. You can't just operate them indefinitely and just hope that they work. Also, be careful that uh, sometimes some uh, countries will not allow you to incinerate because there is a potentially toxic fumes that come out and pollute the environment. And this is why also you have to be careful what you are putting into um, incinerator. And I give you examples on this slide of some, some ways to, that you can and some ways that you cannot put in an incinerator. Next one, please. 
We also sometimes talk about rendering. This is really more for animal carcasses. So if you are doing research with animals or you are in an animal diagnostic lab and you have to dispose of carcasses, you will be use, uh, you, you might use a uh, rendering procedure. And this is, again, same thing. You have to make sure that you maintain equipment and validate your machine as well as your um, runs. Next one, please. Deep burial is another one that is an option. And again, this is something that has to be done correctly. You have to make sure that it is buried deep enough that animals cannot dig, dig the waste up. Also, you need to make sure that you stay from any water that might be circulated underneath. Because if you have water that is circulating in a soil underneath, that can also absorb and take some of that waste and then distribute it further. So it's something that is um, important, an option, but it's important to understand your environment before you decide to do this particular option. Next one, please. We obviously have a chemical treatment. I uh, talk a little bit about that. It's getting rid of dialogical waste, but potentially creating chemical waste. Also, to be careful when you are chemically decontaminated, the contact time is important. And more, of, um, more you have of the organic matter that's present inside or, or your sample or on the surface, you need to make sure that the chemical penetrates that and also that you get enough contact time. So this is something that's really um, important. One thing that I recently, I was at the APSA conference, and there's a group of young kids who are um, uh, in, in college that actually have a wonderful product. They came up with a way of coloring disinfectants uh, that will allow you to visualize the contact time. So they add color, for example, to bleach. And so when you spray bleach, the color is blue. But after in, uh, enough contact time with the surface that you spray it on, that color goes to no color. So from blue to no color, and you know you had enough contact time. So that's something interesting. That's a, a new technology that's just coming up. And I'm looking forward to seeing more applications of that in the future. Next one, please. So here we have. Um, uh, you know, like I said, liquid waste, and it could be different kind of treatment for liquid waste, could be chemical treatment of liquid waste, but also you can heat treat uh, liquid waste by heating it. Sometimes people treat their liquid waste within an autoclave, so inside the autoclave. Sometimes they add chemicals, like I said. Sometimes they have elaborate system that, you know, you will put the waste in and heat the waste and then dispose of it. Again, you have to validate to make sure that you do kill everything that's in that waste before you just let it go down the sink. If you are opting for chemical decontamination, you need to realize that you might be putting chemicals down the drain and you need to know your regulations that uh, will tell you what kind of chemical, if any, you are allowed to put down the drain within uh, your laboratory. Next one, please. Next one. These are just some re really quick pointers from the experience. When you, you are validating your equipment, and I'm taking an example of autoclave validation, please realize that the little tape that we put on things and put it in the autoclave is really will not tell you that you actually had successfully run the cycle and that uh, your waste has been decontaminated. This is just to tell you that there is steam and temperature there, and it will turn very quickly, these, these lines will show up, and it doesn't mean anything. So we tested it and realized that, you know, it, it really, if you're using just tape, that is not uh, enough to validate your machine. Next one, please. So in order to properly do the validation, you can use chemical integrators, and they will t tell you that you had enough exposure to steam so that there was enough steam generated and that the waste was exposed to that steam for a long period of time or adequate period of time. And you can see uh, on a picture to the right how you, you can tell if it's been done properly or not. Next one, please. 
We talk also about biological validation, biological indicators. This is really the, the, the best way of validating. I usually like to put two together, so a little bit of biological, a little bit of chemical, and you get to the overall um, good result. But with biologicals, make sure that if you are using biologicals, if you are putting these biologicals in a waste that contains cultures and, and or uh, some, some materials that might have been wet, like a wipe that might have been a disinfectant wipe, wipe or something like that that you already sprayed with disinfectant, that you don't use these uh, biological indicators that are enclosed in paper because sometimes you'll kill the your indicator before you ever put it in the autoclave. So if you are using it with a wet waste that potentially contains some of the disinfectant wipes or anything like that, you might want to use these uh, glass vials. Next one, please. This is just an example of uh, what we do, is just putting different indicators, and you can see that I have the biological and chemical indicators within little tubes. But I also sometimes use these what I call wireless data logger. Those are just a temperature probe to, uh, me to monitor the temperature within the chamber of the autoclave as well as in within the bag that you um, are autoclaving. And please, when I say within a bag, that means that you put what we call dummy waste. So it's a waste. You're mimicking the waste that you will be putting in the autoclave. So it's a clean in a sense, clean materials that you put in a biohazard bag and you put all these indicators in order to validate your cycle from time to time. Next one, please. This is what it looks after you are done with your validation. You have to dig through that bag. This is why I'm telling you this is a clean waste in a sense. We put clean materials in a bag initially and then once the cycle is done, we dig that out and then we verify, we pull all our indicators out, incubate them, and verify that we actually did get uh, proper exposure to temperature and steam and did achieve kill within that load that we are testing. Next one, please. So to end, I will just, I would like to talk uh, really briefly about uh, how do we strengthen waste management at the country level, and this is an example of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, it's, um, they started with no program for waste disposal. Waste was basically thrown out in the back of the hospitals, uh, research labs. And over the years, thanks to really one man, uh, Dr. Assad, he really point, started pulling people together and getting outside um, ex experts and help to, to basically generate a common way of disposing of waste in Bangladesh. And we have achieved that now. It's in the, its infancy, but uh, we are starting to have uh, the regulations that are being written at the ministry level. We have a group that actually does this waste treatment, so they will come to your institution, pick up your waste, and then take it to their site, which is off-site, outside of the city, they will process that waste properly and then dispose of it. So if we go next to the next slide, this, these are just some pictures of the actual facility. So you can see that they do tri triage of waste. And um, when, when this started first, nobody wore any protective equipment. People are triaging waste by hand. And obviously, you have sharps, you have infectious materials. So we went in and we trained the staff and provided uh, protective equipment for them. So they all have gloves and respiratory protection, uh, aprons, et cetera, depending on what waste they are sorting and if it is before or after the waste is being treated. And this is, uh, if you move, go to the next, you can see that they are uh, using these uh, force uh, mechanical devices to separate the way so they are not actually, even though they have gloves, they are not touching anything with their gloved hands. Next one, please. So in their, in their overall disposal facility, they have shredding unit. They use this to shred sharps, mainly needles. Next one, please. 
And that is important because you do not want those needles to be reused. We have a huge issue of uh, re reusal of needles, which then potentially can spread uh, disease uh, if that happens. So shredding it is great. These are just some autoclaves, and you can see these are rather large autoclaves. So at that, their facility, they have ability to also autoclave the waste. Next one, please. This is just a little symbol of effluent treatment. They actually can treat their liquids, and this is just a step-by-step -step process that, uh, that they use to treat their liquid waste. Next one, please. On a, uh, in the same group, on the same site, they also have an incinerator, and so they can incinerate waste as well, depending on what waste we are dealing with. So you can see that uh, this was... This is not some Western country that has a lot of resources. This is country that struggles that, um, with resources, but however, they were able to pull things together and get some help with the help of other organizations such as Fondation Meru. I know that Nicholas works uh, very closely with uh, Bangladesh and Dr. Assad and other groups uh, to actually be able to get some of the materials, be able to train people and afford some of the personal protective equipment and have this uh, overall company that will come now, pick up the waste and treat the waste. Obviously, this is uh, not yet across the whole country of Bangladesh. It's mainly focused in the capital of Dhaka, but it's a good example and it's something that's being now written into, like I said, regulation at the ministry level that's being expanded outside of city of Dhaka. Recently, uh, we were able to um, contract a local manufacturing group to actually produce biohazard bags and a sharp containers that are produced, again, within country of Bangladesh, so they don't have to spend a lot of money to buy those products outside of the country. And uh, I, I, I'm not exactly sure, but Dr. Assad did calculate uh, the, the cost savings are, are just huge. I mean, I, I think they went from paying like $20 per sharps container to paying, you know, half a dollar for sharp containers. So there are huge savings, and we, we try to move forward with all this. Next one, please. Thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions uh, that you might have.